All right, welcome to week two. In test out, we cover cables and connectors. In section 2.1.1, they cover twisted pair. And as they've stated, it's cheaper and more flexible. It's even faster than coaxial cable, which both use copper. It's just coax has a solid, single solid core, whereas twisted pair has multiple uh, copper wires that are stranded together or twisted together. So it is comprised of co uh, twisted copper wire, either strands or solid core. It is advised to use the solid core. Uh, having used both, it's definitely better to use the solid core because if you're buying a box of unterminated cable, a big spool of cable, you definitely want to use a solid core. Uh, it's better than having the stranded and only being able to use it maybe for patch cable. So if you use solid core, you could pull it through walls, ceilings, etc. It's more reliable and is also easier to terminate. So the twists in the twisted pair uh, eliminate crosstalk. Computers receive electrical impulses as data. If you have two wires that are running parallel, they're both sending power through those wires. Both wires are receiving power and they will begin to almost override each other because of the EMI that's being emitted. So in order to eliminate that, not only do they improve shielding, but then they found that if they twisted the wire, that didn't happen as much. And so then you also have the shielded twisted pair or STP and unshielded twisted pair, the UTP. Uh, and that refers to the metal shield around the wires or lack of shielded as the UTP case is. And that helps to eliminate or absorb the EMI from outside sources so you don't get interruptions. So the cable types, as they've gone through the, the list there are CAT3, CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, CAT6A, CAT7, and they will continue to add more categories to that twisted pair cable that will improve signal, uh, speeds, et cetera. Eventually, I think they're gonna get to a point where they just switch over to fiber because it's gonna be about the same as far as cost, speeds, and everything else. The only difference, again, as we'll cover in fiber, uh, twisted pair is definitely easier to pull and is less apt to have issues with breakage, et cetera. There is a, a limit, though, to the twisted pair cable. Uh, you can only go 100 meters, which is about 330 feet. And of course, it uses the, the ends of RJ45 for Ethernet. Uh, RJ48C, GG45, and the Terra connections, and they covered those in the test out. The most common you'll see is the RJ45. That's really what's in use today. The RJ11 is for telephone. So why did we include that in the twisted pair? Uh, they actually have telephone wire. Why should we uh, include that here? Because you can actually use uh, category three, category five, et cetera, for telephone if you have to and you terminate, it, terminate that in RJ11. All right, let's briefly show what these cables look like. Even though they've showed demonstrations in the videos, I'm gonna actually show you what this cable really looks like, kind of point out the, the parts that they're talking about. All right, so this is a standard twisted pair. You can kind of see, unfortunately my lighting's a little bright, there we go. You can actually see the various individual twisted wires there. get into more detail in just a second here. Here's the, uh, the sheath on the outside. Then you have another type of twisted pair, different manufacturer. So it's gonna actually have different components on the inside. And I mentioned this because, just because this actually has a backbone to it. That's this plastic little piece right here. Yeah, that's a plastic piece. <laughs> that right there helps to separate the wires, gives more stability as you're pulling, as does the Kevlar strand right here. So some manufacturers will go the extra mile, which you pay for, <laughs> and actually include some of those things in with it. The wire feels the cable itself feels much thicker, is a little bit stiffer, 
uh, because of the, the backbone here. And it's easier to pull this without having to worry about it snapping because so it says this cable right here doesn't have any of that. So you have to be a little bit more careful. You always have to be careful anyway, obviously, but you have to be a little bit more careful with this one because it doesn't have that backbone. It doesn't have the Kevlar strand. And so as you're pulling on this, if it gets stuck in the conduit and you were to <laughs> yank really hard, uh, you could just snap that cable off. And when you're pulling a long distance and sometimes through not the most ideal situations, you really, really don't wanna have to either rerun one cable or have to fish stuff through, you know, crawl back up into crawl spaces, it's not fun. So definitely be careful when pulling cable. And if you have this stuff with the backbone and Kevlar, it's a little bit easier. So we talked about shielded twisted pair. So this is a shielded twisted pair. So it has, this one is like extra shielded. It has not only the Kevlar strand for strength, it has this uh, metal on the outside, which is almost like a grounding. And then of course the foil wrap. This also has a plastic wrap to keep the wires contained. And then of course you have your twisted pair and those are solid core wires, they're not stranded. And this one is definitely good for running through, let's say a ceiling, uh, through anywhere there's going to be a lot of electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic interference, such as over ballasts in ceiling lights, uh, next to near power lines, et cetera. Uh, also, there are some companies like Extron that require you to use this type of cable when connecting their uh, video to ethernet adapter because any sort of interference. And these wires right here, they're gonna pick up some EMI. It's just the computer is able to deal with some distortion, some static on the line. Uh, as long as it doesn't start corrupting data, it's usually able to handle it. But some equipment, especially video equipment, it uh, is more sensitive. So it can't handle a lot of the interference that's coming through. So any little static, it's going to either start distorting the picture or make the equipment stop working altogether. So companies like Extron will actually require you to wire their equipment with this shielded twisted pair. And like I said, this actually has extra shielding on it in order to really absorb any EMI that comes through. So that way their equipment is, is safe. So with the shielded twisted or with the twisted pair cable, when you're going to terminate the ends, either in a keystone jack or on an RJ45, a punch panel, uh, patch panel, punch block, what you're gonna need to do is separate those wires initially because as you see, they're all twisted. So just separate it, depending on what you're doing. If you're doing an RJ45 end, what I like to do is give myself a nice length. And then I untwist it all and, so it's untwisted all. Side note, an electrician's trick for untwisting all of these, uh, little wires here is when you strip the shield off here, you'll end up with this empty little tube. You can hook it onto the end and just run it down and it untwists those wires. I don't always use that method because sometimes for me, it's faster to just take the wires and untwist them all real quick and move on. I've done enough, I've done enough cables that it's just, I do it without thinking and I'm able to hook my nail in there, I'll bring it down here where you can see, and just do a quick twist. And it's done. But then you end up having this scraggly bunch of wires right there, and that for sure will not go into an RJ45 connection, and it just makes it really difficult to punch down if you're going into a keystone or a patch panel. So what you wanna do is straighten those out. And one of the ways to do that is to run that over your finger like so, so you pinch it between your thumb, get my fingers in there, 
pinch it between your thumb and your index finger, and then just pull the wire and kind of strip, strip that out. So. It's it fairly straight and you can fine tune as, as is needed. So for the most part, you're ready to go. Then what you do is you go through, if you're doing in a RJ45, you have to put them in the appropriate color coded order. So I like to use the industry standard of the T568B. Now that's usually what you find in most places. That's usually what you find in manufactured cables. It's just easier to stick with that rather than trying to do A or you definitely don't want to come up with your own wiring method. That is just a headache waiting to happen. So stick with an industry standard. And I always choose the uh, T568B, which is orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green, brown, white, brown. So I've got those, those wires there. So once I get them in the appropriate order, again, I straighten them out. This particular cable, if I were to strip these back, I can do that on one of them here. So I'll strip back one of the cables. This is not a solid core. This is a stranded core. And these are a real pain to work with. The wires don't like to straighten out easy. Uh, they're very flimsy and definitely susceptible to breakage. So all of those little strands of wires, they can start breaking on you and then you're gonna have connection issues. So that's why I always advise going with a solid core. All right, so once you have your, your wires color-coded, I like to trim up the ends just so they go in easier. So now you have a nice straight, straight edge and you can actually slip that into an RJ45 jack a lot easier and then crimp it down. And at the end, this is a manufactured cable, but this shows you what that end would look like. And there are different RJ45 jacks that can be used. Uh, some are just the standard RJ45 jack. And if you look inside, it actually has offset channels that the wires are supposed to slide into. Those are definitely harder to terminate with than say the kind that let the wires just slide all the way through the jack. That way, you know, you've got the right uh, wire pairing and then you just snip off the ends, crimp down your wire and you're good to go. Another type actually has a sleeve that you stick over the wires and then feed it into your jack. That's also an easier one to terminate with. The issue with that is when you are getting ready to put your wires into the sleeve, make sure you cut your wires at, a, at an angle, at a 45 degree angle, rather than straight across. You'll find it's a whole lot easier to stick it in the sleeve because as the sleeve comes down, it then grabs one wire at a time and feeds it through those holes in the sleeve. Whereas if you approach the sleeve with a perfectly cut <laughs> group of wires, um, it's just a whole lot harder to, to put it through because they all want to go through either the same hole or they just start bunching up and it gets really frustrating. So if you cut it at a 45 degree angle, that sleeve will grab one wire at a time and you can just slide it right on there and then cut your wire and then slide the wire and sleeve into the RJ45 jack and crimp it down. So those are the different types and you can definitely go online and look those up. Again, it all depends on the business you're working for and how much they were willing to spend for the RJ45 ends. Is the preferred wire casing to be used when you're installing in uh, crawl spaces and ceilings, et cetera? This will be on the test, so keep this in mind. If you're installing within a crawl space, ceiling, anywhere other than, anywhere where there's a, an air gap, you need to use a plenum rated cable. That's in case there's a fire and the fire starts traveling through the airspace up there. As it burns, the cable, <laughs> the cable will not emit, it won't burn as fast, it's more heat resistant and it won't emit as many noxious fumes. Side note, to be honest, if there's a fire in a building, probably the last thing everybody's gonna be worrying about are the noxious fumes from a Cat6 cable in the ceiling. 
But for industry standards, for the test, and if you as the network admin are put in charge of overseeing contractors and making sure that they have the appropriate equipment, appropriate industry standard equipment that's been approved by your organization, then you really need to make sure that the right kind of cable is being installed. So ceiling insulation, J hooks, definitely don't just string cables all over the ceiling. Like in a drop ceiling, there's a big temptation to do that. Do it the right way. At the very least, follow a nice path. Do not just string it over the panels. Don't let it dangle on the panels. Don't let cables dangle on, on lights, of course. And make sure that they're following a nice path that keeps them off of the panels and off of the lights, away from power lines. One way to do that is with what they call J hooks. It's basically just what it says, uh, a hook that's in the shape of a J that screws into the ceiling joist and you run your cables along it. Usually has a nice clip, so that way it keeps all the cables inside. So again, beware of EMI in the lights, electronics and power outlets up in ceilings. You'll find that there's a myriad of things, especially in a drop ceiling. You pop a panel, you think, okay, this should be a straight run. You pop a panel and you go, oh my goodness, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff up here. There's ducting, there's power cables going everywhere uh, for lights. There are light panels everywhere. Sometimes there are speaker wires. There's all sorts of stuff uh, that you have to be aware of, not only for your own safety, but also for the cable that you're running. You don't want that interference on a data cable. And then through a wall installation, those can be difficult. Sometimes there's a dedicated pathway to get up through the wall, and that's very nice. Other times you have to use a fish wire and pull string and all sorts of fun stuff to get up through there. Side tip, if there are old wires in place, you can usually find where they come out in the, in the ceiling. So that lets you know where the wire's at, where the holes are at, where the conduit may be at, if you're lucky enough to have conduit. But you can also use that as a pull string. Attach your new wires and a new pull string to that cable that you've, you've cut. Go down to the wall, undo your panel, whatever else, get your, get your wire and just start pulling it down. Hopefully that old wire will allow you to pull everything else through. At the very least, it'll let you pull through a, a pull string. So that way you can pull your other cables. Audio and phone usage for CAT cables, we covered that briefly, that you can use CAT 6 or below for phone. And to be honest, category three cable, CAT 3 cable is very common for phone lines. Uh, so is CAT 5. So if you have a contractor that comes along and says, yeah, I've got a whole box of, you know, CAT 3 cable, I'm going to pull a length this way and that way, stop them right there and say, CAT 3, I'm sorry, but industry standard at this time is CAT six or whatever it happens to be. You need to make sure that the installers are using the appropriate equipment because a lot of times they will cut corners or they just may not know. Companies will hire the lowest bidder and say, yeah, an electro uh, electrician, he can pull cables because after all, he's pulling wire. He may as well be up there pulling data cables also. Having pulled both, you handle them both differently. When you pull a power cable through, you can really usually yank on that thing. You don't have to worry about snapping something off. You don't have to worry about crimping something. With a data cable, you have to be a little bit more careful how you pull it, and you also have to be aware of crimping. Now, category six cable, let's say, is definitely more forgiving than fiber, as we'll talk in a second. But you still have to watch for crimping. You don't want a serious bend in that cable because it's going to start degrading the signal and then wearing down your wire. And eventually it'll just snap all of those wires off inside and you will lose signal. So pay attention to contractors, to various installers as they're installing wire, make sure that they're installing the appropriate wire in the appropriate places and that they're not you know, next to power cables. Coaxial cable in section 2.2.1. Uh, they went through the different types of coax cable, RJ58 for thin net networking, RJ59 for cable TV, 
RJ6 for satellite and cable modems. Uh, and then the different types of connectors, the BNC connector, which is fairly common, and then the F-type, which is usually used for cable and satellite TV connections. It has a screw end, and you've seen that if you have cable TV or cable satellite and a cable motor. Really, not too many places use coax cable for networking anymore. You, you'll usually see that in like a DMARC point if your company or your home uses uh, either satellite or a cable motor. Fiber optic network cable, 2.3.1. So fiber optic uses laser or LED light to send a signal to the computer or to the, to the node. Pretty much like what we talked about before with the on off switch or you know, using Morse code with a flashlight, it's kind of the same concept, except light travels a lot faster than electricity and can go a lot further than electricity, whereas electricity begins to lose its power after a certain period of time, light can go a whole lot further before it begins to degrade. So two types of cable, you have single mode and multi-mode. So single mode, you can go longer, you can go longer distances, uh, and it uses a single light ray that only is refracted or reflected a few times, rather, with inside the glass tubing versus multi-mode, which you can only go shorter distances, and it, there's a lot of light signals bouncing up and down. The benefits of multi-mode over single mode is multi-mode is less expensive. Also, multi-mode can sometimes transmit more data. So you kind of have to weigh the pros and the cons. As it shows there, multi-mode can travel a distance between 100 to 1500 feet. Remember, Cat6 cable can only go to uh, 100 meters or 330 feet, roughly. Single mode, on the other hand, can go roughly between five kil kilometers or three miles to 10 kil kilometers or 6.2 miles. So that's a big difference. Let's talk real quick about uses. Single mode is really good for connecting buildings. Let's say you have multiple buildings on a campus. If you can have single mode fiber run from one building to the next, you can be assured of high speeds and the fact that you can go a lot longer distances without having to have a repeater or something in between. Whereas multi-mode can oftentimes be used between floors, although single mode is also good for using between floors, but multi-mode can be used between floors or patching together, let's say, you know, switches, et cetera. Then there are connection types in the fiber world. You have the LC, SC, FT, S, FC, <laughs> which is only available to the single mode, the MU and the MTRJ. And I just threw a bunch of letters at you. And now you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So let me show you two of the more common connections. So you have this right here, as you can see, is a yellow cable. It's thinner, uh, is a single mode cable. This right here is an orange cable and a little bit thicker. That is a multi-mode cable. You can definitely feel the difference uh, if you've ever felt a fiber optic cable. The single mode is definitely very thin because it uses a thinner glass tube, whereas a multi-mode uses a bigger glass tube in order to reflect a bunch of light signals. So this connection right here is the LC or little connector, as I like to remember it which is one of the more common connections versus the SC. Now this one normally has a, a bracket that it clicks into, so that way you can plug it into a, a node of some sort, but that bracket has been taken off momentarily, so we can kind of show this. So as you see the fiber optic end there, And if you were to plug that into a network device of some sort, it would begin to send signal over that fiber optic cable, provided that the network device supported fiber and provided that the proper 
adapter was connected. So we'll talk briefly about GBIX in a little bit, but let me show you what they look like real quick since I have my camera up. So this little device, go, is called a GBIC. So it has a little circuit board that plugs into a switch. So GBIX will plug into a switch into that fiber optic receptacle right there. There we go. So you can kind of see inside and that GBIC, as you see the connector, the pin connector in the back, uses the plug in just like that. There you go, clicks in. Now, this particular GBIC is a fiber to Ethernet. So if you have a switch that only has a fiber port available and you need to plug in an Ethernet connection, that's what this little guy does. He converts it to He converts that fiber connection to an ethernet connection. Then you have a fiber GBIC. So you see the two connections there that will plug into, this happens to be a LC fiber GBIC. It has a two receptacles there for receiving light. Has a little lockdown bracket. So this allows fiber to be connected to this particular switch. So as you see, that fiber is now plugged into the GBIC in order to get that fiber cable out because it has a bracket with a release. You can just squeeze that and pull the fiber out. And then once you're ready to pull the GBIC out, pop down its little arm and slide it out. Now, some of the GBICs actually have a button that you can push and it releases that GBIC. Section 2.3.1 fiber optic cable. Uh, so terminating, you can, the the regular network admin, the regular network tech can terminate a category six, a twisted pair end on an RJ45 or whatever. It takes special training, special tools, and special skill to terminate a fiber optic cable. If you can get training to do that, that actually, that industry will pay you quite a bit of money because again, it is a skill. And why is it such a skill? I mean, it's just terminating the end of a cable. Well, again, it's not copper. It's not something that can be easily just crimped and pressed together or whatever. It's a glass tube and you have to make sure that according to whatever end you use, you have to cut the cable appropriately and make sure you don't fracture the tube on the inside. So they, I've actually watched guys do this. They have a special cutter that they'll use that basically scores the glass tube. They cut it and then they have to peel back the shielding a little bit. And then they use a buffer and they have to buff that glass. They have to get it just right. And then they put it up against a, uh, a tester that basically transmits light and the receiver checks the quality of the buffering. So, or the polishing. So this is where we have the polish ratings. So your PC or physical contact usually used on single mode fiber, the SPC, the UPS and the APC, different ways to terminate and polish a fiber optic cable. Again, because it's a glass tube, it's not copper. It can't just be crimped or whatever. It has to be polished. It has to be made so when the light comes through, it's not refracted. It's not distorted in some way. It comes through clean. As they talked about, fiber optic cable is really good at preventing eavesdropping. So because it's a glass tube, you can't just come along and put a crimper on it and listen to the traffic that's going by. You'd actually break the tube and terminate the connection. And then everybody would know that something went wrong with the cable and the connection. So fiber optic is really good for security. It's also high speeds and can go over long distances, but it is more expensive and does require, if it's being installed, usually requires a certified fiber optic installer. So we talked briefly about the twisted pair cable construction in section 2.4.1 and how you would terminate that. And they give some examples on the video. If you ever get a chance, uh, definitely encourage you to go someplace where you can terminate some cables. If you can serve even 
as an intern or as a helper. There are many contractors who just need somebody to help them terminate cable. It's pulling and terminate, terminating cable can be kind of a tiring and backbreaking job. And after a while, you'll begin to develop certain calluses on your fingers as you strip wires and so forth. But at least you'll learn how to do it and it is very rewarding. So you can make straight through cables, which is your standard patch cable, crossover cables for connecting one node to another, usually two computers together. So you would statically assign IP addresses to those computers and then plug in the crossover cable and they could communicate back and forth. You can also connect switches that way, though most switches today don't require a crossover cable, uh, just a straight through patch cable will work just fine. We talked about the uh, T568A and T568B standards. A is not very common, though you will see it sometime. You have to keep that in mind because that happens occasionally where something has been wired with the A standard and you're coming in with the B standard. B is more common. That's again, what you usually find in patch cables, et cetera. And those, the GW, G, O, W, et cetera, those are the green, white, green, orange, white, blue, blue, white, orange, brown, white, brown. And then of course for the, the B, it's the orange, white, orange, et cetera. When you terminate a cable, always make sure it's qualified. And that means that you usually have a device that plugs into both ends. Uh, one device has a battery, it's powered, you press a button and it sends a signal through to a receiver on the other side, which then sends the signal back and says, hey, we're good. Um, and it lets you know that everything has been terminated properly, there are no breaks, uh, everything is good to go and you can use that cable. Also qualifying, make sure that the cable is rated for certain speeds. So there are times where you actually need gig speeds or you need only 100 megabit speeds. That's where the qualifying comes in. You can say, yes, I know that this cable is uh, terminated properly and that it's rated at gig speeds. Then if you're finding a cable, there are many times as a network admin, you are told to go install something, go fix something, whatever the case may be, or even just patch in somebody's computer and you get to the wall jack and you have no idea where that cable goes. You, you have a rough idea. It goes someplace in an IDF nearby, but obviously you're not going to know which cable it is if it's not labeled appropriately. And many times they're not labeled appropriately, even if they have a label. So don't always trust the label. Be prepared to bring out your toning or tracing kit. They also call it a fox and hound from the old days of the uh, telephone. They would send a signal over the telephone and they would chase the signal like a fox or like a hound chases a fox. So a toning kit plugs into the jack and sends a audible signal over that wire. You have a wand in your hand and you go to where you think the other end of the wire has been terminated. You go into that building and you rub your wand over all of the wires to figure out which wire is actually sending the signal. Wiring distribution, they talked about DMARC or demarcation point, the MPO, uh, main point of entry. So that's where your internet service provider will come into the building. Their responsibility is to bring your business the connection to go through the wall, however it's been set up, and provide their equipment on the other side of the wall, such as a modem or something. Sometimes the DMARC point is separate from the MDF or main distribution frame. Sometimes the MDF and data center are one and the same. So you'll hear those phrases sometimes used to mean the same thing and they're not always the same thing. So your demarcation point is oftentimes separate from your MDF. Not always, but a lot of times. This is the room next to the MDF where the demarcation point is located. This is where the internet service provider's equipment comes in from the street into the building. In this particular MDF, the demarcation point is in another room, so the internet service provider had to provide an extension into the MDF so they could install their equipment. As mentioned in other videos, the MDF is oftentimes the data center. And as you can tell, it can be kind of loud in here due to the number of equipment 
including a large battery backup, servers, separate battery backups, and of course various AC units. Then you have your IDF or intermediate distribution frames. So that's where um, you have your edge switches. That's where a lot of times, because you, your MDF is where all of your main stuff is at. That's where your distribution is, switches, your core switch, your router, uh, sometimes where your frame, your servers are. Again, this is sometimes combined with a data center. So this is like where the majority of your heavy network lifting is done. And then the IDFs are the data closets, as they call them. There are rooms scattered around that provide a distribution point for jacks in the walls because copper cable can only go how many meters? 100 meters or 330 feet roughly. Now you can go further, just as a side note, if you absolutely have to, but I don't recommend it because you begin to lose signal. You experience attenuation where your signal begins to degrade rapidly. So because cable can only be pulled so far, a lot of times you have to have an intermediary closet where those cables come in, they plug into a switch, it gives that signal an extra boost again and sends it out fresh to the MDF. Again, the data center and the MDF are sometimes the same thing. Sometimes there's a DMARC extension. That means that your DMARC, if it comes into another room, has to be extended into your MDF or IDF as the case may be in a smaller situation. And you do have to sometimes pay the internet service provider to do that as well. Patch panels versus a punch down block. So patch panels are actually nicer than a punch down block. Punch down block is basically allowing you to connect wires onto a block, connect wires on the other side of the block and they make a connection that way. Go into a patch panel, it's easier to mark where everything is, it's easier to organize, and then you go from your patch panel directly down into your switch. Keep in mind a patch panel is basically an extension of all of the wall jacks into that area. And so a lot of organization ideas go into how to, how to organize wall jacks and patch panels. Then of course you have your 66 block. 66 block is the old fashioned POTS uh, phone line system where it terminated into a white block. This is a 66 block where the POTS telephone line or landline is terminated on this side. As you can see, the mess of cables coming through there are from that very thick white cable right there. Go across the wall, down and into the box where the demarcation point is uh, for the service provider. Then, on this side, is where you have the wall jack for the phone. So, and those cables come from, of course, the floor above or wherever. And so what you do is you take your toner, you plug it into the wall, and then your wand comes down here to figure out where exactly the wall jack is located. On this side is where you have your extensions, and usually they're written down someplace, either on the 66 block or even on the wall. But usually there's a record of where the extensions are located on this side. And then you jumper the wall jacks accordingly. So if so-and-so is sitting at a particular extension and you figured out that the wall jack is over here, you find the, the wire, bring it up over, and then you would use your punch tool to terminate. Continuing on with section 2.4.4, punch down blocks. Uh, let's see. Note the wiring schematic on the side of the keystone jack or the back of the patch panel. That is very important because keystones, depending on the manufacturer, will be different. They don't all have the same, usually, they don't always all have the same wiring schematic. And 
patch panels are actually a little bit better at this, but sometimes they're different, so you really have to pay attention. When you're punching down a keystone, use a flat surface or a stand when you're punching down that keystone because, and I will switch over real quick, because using your punch tool here, and they even have a little symbol, cuts the wire, beware. This end right here is actually very sharp. And what it's supposed to do, as you punch the wires into the patch panel or the keystone, it pushes the wires between two crisscross teeth. So those wires go down inside and the crisscross teeth move and basically cut through the shielding on that little cable, on that little wire. And the copper crisscross not only cuts through that little shielding, but then it also makes contact with the copper wire. And so that's where this grooved punch part comes in. It actually grabs the wire and shoves it down in between those two little teeth. So you do this with each wire. Usually with punch tools like this, again, there is a sharp end right there that it will snip off the spare wire on the end so you don't have a bunch of dangly pieces. It makes it all nice and clean. So when you're punching down into a patch panel, make sure the patch panel has been mounted. Or if you're using a keystone, put it on a flat surface or preferably a stand. So that way, as you punch and you use a lot of pressure, so as you punch it down, it has a spring inside, spring loaded. This pushes down inside and then that spring loaded hammer comes down and slams this up against the wire to shove it into those little crisscrossed copper teeth. And I mention all of that because as you're putting a lot of pressure on a keystone, the keystone is maybe only an inch wide. You're putting a lot of pressure onto a tiny little wire going into a plastic half or uh, inch wide box. And as you push really hard, that box like wants to move and jump around on you. So because of leverage <laughs> and just the amount of pressure you're putting on it. So you definitely don't want to try to terminate a keystone against your hand, against your leg or something like that. Always use a flat, hard surface and really try to hold on to it good with your hand if you don't have a tray. And that's why a tray is recommended. So troubleshooting your copper wiring issues in section 2.5.1. We talked before about EMI, watching out for power cables. Uh, EMI can just cause disruption of data, can interfere with the wireless signal also, keep that in mind. So attenuation, we talked about the cable length, heat, et cetera, will begin to degrade the signal. There's also an impedance mismatch on coaxial cable. So ohms, the amount of resistance in a copper wire needs to match. Signal hopping or crossing, that's when you have two wires that are parallel, they need to be twisted, hence the twisted pair. Or if you have, let's say, a good example of signal hopping or crossing even would have a, be a power line next to a twisted pair wire or twisted pair cable. And then wire mapping, figuring out where your wires are going using tools and also using that tool to make sure that everything is terminated properly. Troubleshooting fiber optic wiring issues in section 2.5.3. It's a little bit more problematic. Unlike copper wire that you can usually do a trace, repunch, re-terminate easily, uh, fiber is not always that easy. So unless you have a, uh, an expensive piece of equipment to check the signal, a lot of times you're left with trying to just figure it out by replacing a patch cable or even shining a flashlight through it if you have to. So some things to check. Check your connections, make sure that they're the same, LC to SC, that sort of thing. Clean the ends, make sure that they haven't gotten dirty. Make sure that they're plugged into the correct side. So with the LC and the SC on the one SC connection I showed you, it didn't have a bracket. And so the two wires were pulled out of the bracket. Uh, a lot of times you have a left and a right. You have to pay attention how that is wired 
into your nodes and into your patch, cable, uh, patch panel. So fiber patch panel, you have an installer run fiber from one building to the next, there will be two patch panels. So that way you can connect fiber to the different nodes to communicate back and forth. Sometimes installers will do a left and right on one side and a right and left on the other. So don't always assume that they're gonna be the same on both sides. Sometimes you have to pop the, pop the fiber cable out of its little bracket and switch the ends so left becomes right, et cetera. Make sure the polish rating matches for those that require a specific rating. And make sure the diameter is the same. Usually the diameters are going to be the same, but again, make sure that you're not mismatched along the way. Then of course, check the node. Does it support fiber? Make sure your GVIC supports it. And that is the proper GVIC. You have single mode and multi-mode GVICs. And yeah, some adapters go bad. I've had GVICs go bad on me. So check some simple things first. If you've got some spare equipment, start swapping things out to see what the issue was. Then of course the loss budget, as they talked about, the distance of how many devices are connected or daisy chained to the fiber. And then uh, I talked before about using a flashlight. You can use also a smartphone, uh, the camera on your smartphone, and we'll see in a minute. You have a, what you think is a live fiber wire. Never look at it with your eye. For one thing, you won't see the light, but it's gonna do some damage to your eye because a lot of times they're laser. So you use the camera on your phone. Try to get into a darkened part of the room if you can hold the fiber up to the camera, and then you'll be able to see a light flashing through on your camera. One method for checking fiber connections is to take your phone and hold it up so you can actually see the end of a fiber connection. As you see, there's an actual laser beam coming from one of those fiber optic cables. You never want to look at these things straight in the eye as oftentimes they do admit laser. But this is a, a good way to check for troubleshooting. So we know that there's a live connection on the one side here. If you're tracing, so let's say you're at a patch panel and you have no idea where that is terminated on the other side and you've got 50 possible choices or 24 possible choices. Um, you can use fairly bright flashlight, either plug it in or prop it up to the one end, go to the other patch panel, turn off the light in the room and look real close at the other patch panel and you should see two of those guys lighting up. And then of course you can always use a tracing tool. That's much preferred, but more expensive. Continuing troubleshooting tools, having spare equipment on hand. Uh, you can always use a loopback plug or ping the 127.0.0.1 on a node. Uh, you may need to have your ISPA test the connection uh, with their smart jack if it's fiber, um, you know, modem, however they've connected you. Uh, of course, there are cable testers. We've talked about that. Certifiers uh, talked about that device. It's also sometimes the cable testers are a combination certifier. Tone generator and pro, we talked about that. You can always use a multimeter if you absolutely have to, though that is kind of clunky, but you could still use that method to where you set it to send a signal through and you can check the continuity of a, of a line. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed this week. Uh, a lot of cables and things to talk about, a lot of terms again to memorize, but if you have any questions, please let me know and we'll go over parts that you're not clear on. Have a good week.